Okay, if you're already familiar with the musical Music Man, that would be really helpful because the story is, I'm wanting to focus on the subtext instead of the actual storyline. And, you know, I might, it might be inferred in the process, but really I want to focus on the subtext. I call this the parable of Music Man because I hear spiritual lessons in the, in the context, in the subtext. People are always, always, always dealing with ego issues and insecurity issues and making compromises socially, balancing or struggling between their creative selves or their spiritual essence self and their survival or fear-based self. Music Man takes place in a very small, very suppressed community, very fine people in a dependable kind of way, and a, but stoic and not particularly warm to newcomers. Um, I was in this in a play in the musical theater context one season a few years back, and I have very deep affection for all of the characters and all of the dynamics of what evolves. In this small town, there is a certain lackluster joylessness about them. And um, the play starts with a, a bunch of salesmen on a train talking about, talking shop about the different towns and how well or you know responsive or not responsive they are and basically River City Iowa was earmarked as something that wasn't very good at uh, welcoming um, salesmen and one of the uh, salesmen on board that train took that as a challenge he'd also been gossiped about so he wasn't really in with that crowd and um, enter Professor Harold Hill into River City Iowa he arrives, he's snubbed, he's trying to figure people out so he can get his angle on selling his musical instruments and basically making a profit and taking off. He runs across an old friend of his, Marcellus. Marcellus represents the piece of this that has a universal kind of empathy. He's, in the, in the story, just someone who used to work with Harold Hill, but had settled down and married somebody in this town and just kind of taken on the persona and the values of that town. But he sees uh, Professor Harold Hill and gets real excited about him and helps him orient to who's who and what's what in the community. And he... Harold Hill is basically warned about marrying the librarian because she's the exceptional person and in that way she's going to be more astute than the rest. Um, truth of the matter is all of these characters represent either states of a person's own ego or what often happens in a community. You have the core members who pay a legions to conformity and just keep status quo going and have a certain amount of fear about things getting out of control. They're afraid of drama. They're afraid of um, pleasure or the possibility of losing control into pleasure. And um, Marion the Librarian is actually controversial person. She's in the community because of her mother, widow Peru, and because she stayed and been loyal to taking care of her baby brother and, you know, compensating for the lack of a father figure in the house. She's dutiful, but she's a little too starry-eyed for this community, a little too uh, enchanted by broader, more worldly things, which is what she's she makes her a very important character in this story. She is sort of like our spiritual essence that we are scared of because 
it's not conforming, it's digressing, it's you know being obtrusive, it's it's challenging and it's liking things without good reason. She loves books, she loves music. And the women, the pick a little ladies, pick a little, talk a little, pick a little, talk a little, cheep, 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 talk a lot, pick a little more. Talk about her above all, speculating on why she got uh, willed the library books. You know, was there something floozy going on there? That it just we have a certain tension about our divine essence, and, and Marian the librarian kind of represents that. She's in the community, but they don't listen to her. They don't. They're afraid of her, and. Um, she tries to teach people how wonderful books are and inspire them with these poets that, that she really loves. And, and, but she's too, because she's one of them, which we all have a divine spark in us, it's, it's like, no, you can't be wonderful if you're one of us. And all of them are just really holding tenaciously on to everything traditional and everything. Meanwhile, their children are kind of disenchanted with them and kind of lost. And um, so along comes Professor Harold Hill and he sizes up the situation and Marcellus helps him a little bit and points out that, you know, Marion Librarian might figure you out. And he, Harold Hill says, I'll, I'll handle her, I'll seduce her. And uh, that's another significant piece. The rawest form of creative energy doesn't really have all that, that much morality. It's just pure delight in inspiration, you know, visionary inspiration, pure and simple. And they have Mayor Shin and his wife Eulalie Shin. Mayor Shin is a wannabe orator. He fumbles a lot and he uses big words inappropriately or mispronounces them a lot. He loves to pontificate. He's a very humorous character. But clearly he is not the gifted order that Music Man is. But, you know, they're familiar with him and he colors inside the lines and he knows who's good and who's bad and he's got the town all divided up into who can be trusted and who can't. And Widow Peru has this pick a little lady entourage, pick a little, talk a little, and they gossip, they know everything too, and Widow, oh, and uh, I, I said Widow Peru, I mean you, Eulalie, Mayor Shin's wife. She's got a certain amount of vanity about her, which was pretty transparent to um, music man Professor Harold Hill. Anyway, he goes into the situation planning on scamming the whole town and making a lot of money. Now, you kind of know it's not really about money, it's about the pleasure he gets from being, from applying his creative, his intuition on all these other things. He doesn't think he wants a home. He doesn't really have any respect for people that stay in one town. He's, you know, you, this is it's a very significant character to me because I identify with Professor Harold Hill. He is an outsider with too much creativity in him and not enough membership. And there's nothing modifying him to prevent him from being uh, an, an exploiter. He's, he's just all charisma and all inspiration. And all, also a huge amount of intuition. He reads people really fast and he tells them he leads them into what is there in them latently. You know, he gets the school bard to start singing like a barbershop quartet everywhere they go. He uh, gets the uh, pickle little ladies and um, Eulalie, the mayor's wife, all excited about being dancers because he, he, he gets uh, interpretive dance. He gets her thinking that she's very, very graceful and beautiful. And these are, you know, secret selves that these people harbor. And he also addresses the whole town to want this band by way of observing that they're afraid of, you know, evils of pleasure and evils of things like the pool hall, 
Now this is right here, River City, trouble, 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 right here. And from that place, he actually leads them into trouble. Um, it's a scam as far as he knows. And Mary and the librarian doesn't really waste any time being very suspicious of him and knowing how to track his records and see if he's actually, you know, got the credentials that he says he does over and over again and so on and so on. He works very hard at seducing her at one point at the library. He gets very, very far. They dance together beautifully and she falls into the magic of his energy. But ultimately she rejects him because he is operating from a very manipulative, contemptuous space. He doesn't believe in anything. The things that she's frustrated with the community, she loves her mother, her mother's a, a very brazen and, uh, you know, point-blank person and very uh, earthy, wise. And her brother is very moody, mopey, and uh, withdrawn socially and thin-skinned if people say anything that embarrasses him. He's got a lisp and he can't handle being made fun of. Very... And anyway, while Professor Harold Hill is making these pitches to sell this band to people and persuading people to buy a sort of musical instruments based on his perception that they have a predisposed talent in a particular kind of cornet or whatever, they all get on board, and as they get on board, and they're going to use the think system. This is cool, too. They're going to learn music, not with sheet music right away, but right from the start with their musical instruments by thinking this minuet in D or something. And he just keeps telling them that, and they're walking around. They, practicing that as if that's going to make them all musicians. But, but the vision they have of themselves in these uniforms playing these band instruments is very infectious. And he's a very charming man and he goes all over the place and meets everybody and they all get charged up by the ideas he was feeding them. But he is in fact putting the, a scam on him but in the middle of stuff, what happens is Marion the librarian observes that her br baby brother has gotten enthusiastic about something. He cares about something for the first time ever. And so she, because she has this transcendent way about her, and she is representative of the divine within us that's latent that we don't admit it to, she um, says to herself, she realizes that even though Harold Hill doesn't intend or consciously know he's got a divine spark to him, that he's truly gifted and that he contributes in a substantial way to the community for inspiring them, um, she sees it because her brother is all lit up. So even though she has already figured out, you know, officially with proof that he is not the credentialed uh, music teacher that he goes around telling everybody he is. She sits on it because she just believes in him. And it's about a kind of intuitive faith. This is good for us. We need this. This is the same thing she's been trying to feed these people from get-go. But, you know, she's modified it with politeness. She's never come on like, oh, good, you know, you're a bunch of fools and I'm going to take your problems and exploit them. You know, you're fierce, you're afraid of pool tables, all right, you know, you're afraid of corruption, I'm going to save you with, you know, this band we're going to have. She doesn't ever, all she, she's been straightforward about this, so along comes this, this devious little semi-demon type guy, and yet, essentially, he has a spark. And when the story culminates, and I, one of the fun things with, as a townsperson was doing this, you know, we think we're very stoic, and our first song is, you know, ought to give Iowa a try, and 
and we're very uniform and very specific about our boundaries and who we are and we're all doing it together and it's just all very but from then on <clears throat> we're on this roller coaster one minute we hate him you know ice cold to him then we love him because he's trouble 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 and he gets us all so oh he's gonna save us and then the next thing we're worried about him lying to us and we're out to get him so yeah every three seconds I'm either running and cheering or running on and booing you know or, you know get him and it's, it's a lot of fun in terms of the energy shifts and how infectious and terribly of one mind a community can get and not really have a clue but they'll be running with it anyway because they're behaving like pack animals and these creative oddballs on the outskirts you know pack animals are into survival and creators are into transcendence and especially Mary the Marion the librarian gets it and she hasn't been listened to but in comes this would-be love interest and he is reaching her brother and upsetting the whole community. So when it comes right down to it, and they've caught him, and they're ready to lynch him, she calls a halt to it, and she starts giving her speech. And this is all very significant: the leaps of faith that happen that let people make quantum healing experiences happen by way of letting themselves be wrong, of not being attached to a prejudgment. Now, Miriam had a prejudgment. She decided he was horrible. But because of her love for her brother, she was saying, okay, maybe not. Because children are that pure spark that ought to be nurtured. And, and if your children aren't being taken care of, chances are you've locked down around something. You've become very, very attached to something that is not worth it. You know, and, and the joylessness in the community is a symptom. And the kids sneaking off and doing things, you know, reading a book, a, a comic book or a joke book or, or playing pool or whatever, that's children looking for soul sustenance. And they have a right to that. And we all have a right to that. But we got to maybe contemplate the possibility that spiritual transcendence and pleasure kind of go together, especially when you put in the ingredient of love and respect and uh, for the greater good kind of thing, a sharing thing. But you can't expect everybody to be clones of each other. And in fact, the most obtrusively mismatched people are even lacking in, you know, I mean, Harold Hill was a scam artist. But because she sees this in him, and she comes to him, comes to his rescue at this juncture, he has a chance to change, too. He has a chance to consider maybe she's right, maybe there is a spark in him. He doesn't believe it, but on her faith, he goes ahead and tries his hand at directing this muse, this little man. The kids are, you know, the, talking the kind of people who love Santa Claus. They believe! They've been practicing in their head. Now they have musical instruments. They believe they can do this song. So he gets his wand up, and he's got the whole town, and the town is at this balance between shall we lynch and, and you know, tar and feather him and all this horrible stuff, or do we consider changing our mind about him based on what Marianne is saying? And, you know, well, let's see if the kids can do it. So he gets his wand up there, and he invests his faith. He at least tries. He goes through the motions. He says, you know, he, that's a sort of commitment to to take an action instead of saying, I scammed you all. You got me. You know, he's actually saying, I can be in relationship with you. I can grow. We can all grow. The kids start playing. They don't play so good. But here's the important. I, I appreciate that the writers did not mirror miraculously create a great band out of those children. They approximated the song, but mostly they bleeped and blopped and squeaked and squawked, and, but they did it with all sincerity, and they did it to the very best of their ability, and the audience is like, and suddenly 
there's a mom screech out, that's my Joey, or whatever. She's so excited because this is what love is doing. The love of the mom is gratified just knowing that her son is happy to be blowing that horn. And she hears what he intends. And that's the key. That, that is the pivot point. The belief in something. And the love that we have for someone that it lets us transcend our cynicism and our, um, you know, our, our possessive or, or rigid attachments to being right. The town in that particular play gives up being right and allows themselves to be inspired. And music man Professor Harold Hill gives up being a scam artist and actually follows through on something that he said. And he trusts the love of Miriam, the librarian, whom no one pr prior to this could figure out whether she was a spinster type or, a, uh, you know, some version of a whore type. She was highly suspect because she just wasn't falling in inside the, you know, this is how you do stuff thing. She wasn't. The story is very, very significant. And, and it tells us a lot about ourselves and it tells us a lot about how we function in communities and how we create walls in our communities. I identify with Harold Hill and or Marion the Librarian. At home, I am a creative somebody. And people listen to me or they're at least, you know, accepting of me. In the community at large, I feel like a Harold Hill. And the more I go back in, the more I almost prepare for the payoff I'm going to get because I'm offended at how insulted I feel. And it comes to me that in our communities, we don't really nurture the gifted or the visionary. That if we know them too well, we'll put them down like we do Mary and the librarian. Because we put our own selves down. And whoever is gifted almost predisposed to have to be a nomadic kind of person, a person who travels and never is really known in a dimensional way. And uh, that's an issue. And, and, you know, the thing that inspired this whole sermon for me, this parable of Music Man, was I, I'm a member of a very small spiritual community and I'm pretty point blank about stuff. I have a, I have shopped a lot of spiritual communities, a lot of churches and what have you, and I see an awful lot of either country clubs or pick a little pile and pick a little pile and cheap, cheap, cheap type cultures. And they're not accomplishing the spiritual evolution they want and, this, and you know, give words to because they're holding on to what's safe and measurable. And you really, from my point of view, if you want to grow spiritually, you've got to do some risk taking. You've got to be willing to be wrong. You've got to be willing to let go of some of those attachments. And you've got to consider the possibility that bad people have something good to give you if some piece of you can say, I see your spark, and get them to feel that. I see your spark. You gave this community something. I mean, he's about 10 billion times better orator than their, than their mayor, Shin, and Mary and the Librarian is a whole lot more beautiful and graceful than you, Lee Shin, or the Pick a Little Ladies that were doing that... Um, interpretive dance doing the fountain. They're very humorous and everything, but when people who are very suppressed try to be creative, they get, they produce something very stunted, very self-conscious. And, you know, if you really want that full birth, you've got to be 
totally visible. And you know, one of one of the things I've enjoyed from being a nomadic type person is if my vulnerabilities show, you know, get to get a hook into them and and dominate me or stratify me that way. I y'all won't be here that long. You know, that's what I like about uh, retreats and what have you. Is a very short term. You get the relationship energy of you know the spiritual experience and. But, honest to God, when it comes into trying to nestle into a community in a church or anything, there's a real strong tendency for people's ego issues, their wounds, their baggage, their scripts, the things they're familiar with, to come back up. And even I'm doing it. I mean, I'm getting into a more and more jaded spot where I've just been through too many towns. And, uh, you know, I don't know that I'm going to find a, a mirror in the librarian type person who says, wow, you're doing something that I want other people to hear, to, you know, to totally interpret. Because she, she couldn't inspire her little brother to care. She cared about him, but it wasn't until this vivid vision was granted him. Now, at the time, Professor Harold Hill didn't really think he could direct or that the thing system would really work for him. But married to this, or coupled up, you know, like that with... This, the substance of her devotion to her community, that helps bring that all into a better place. I'm just saying, we need to, as a culture, contemplate the possibility that our attachments are what choke us out and that just the energy of being inspired about something will bring about a great light. And it doesn't have to be a band, <laughs> you know, but something that becomes a source of fellowship. And, uh, you know, consider the possibility that people that don't quite fit in might have the most to give or have a profoundly necessary role and things. Anyway, that's me covering Parable of Music Man, trying to kind of summarize all these personalities and how they um, draw a picture. Thank you for listening. I had my... had a voice for a little while. Thank you.